Hello everybody, today we're getting straight into the Convergence mod for Elden Ring, a mod which allows you to do stuff like this. Nice, very nice. This mod introduces a ton of new things to the lands between. Besides a lot of more spells and incantations, we have a couple of new weapons with awesome measures of war, redesigned areas as well as a few new bosses. Exciting, isn't it? But before we get there, we of course have to start from the beginning. We've got a lot of new classes to start with, which each have their unique playstyle and even individual starting zones. I started as the Aberrant Heretic, and our starting area was in Liurnia. Each class has a path they can follow in order to find stronger spells or incantations. Better scaling has been added to almost everything in the game. No longer do we only care about weight and poise when it comes to gear, as they now give stats and even specific bonuses, so it is almost always better to have a complete set equipped. As you can see, the Aberrant class bleeds everything to death. As cool as that sounds, it wasn't too interesting in the beginning. I went down into a tunnel and killed a giant for beast rune. This is the main gist of the mod and is how we get new stuff to throw at people. They come in different tiers, but that is all listed in the path notes. We can also find various remnants from bosses or chests. Remnants are turned into talismans at a grace, so finding them has become incredibly easy. Erd Tree Sentries is one of the few new bosses added. Much like the avatars, they protect minor Erd Trees. The minor Erd Trees now have a unique teleporter activate when you kill the boss attached to it. With this, we can travel across all Erd Tree locations that exist in the game, making it very quick and pain free to get to the area you want to, as long as it's close to a Erd Tree. All Sentries and avatars also drop a remnant that we turn into Physic Tears. There's a few new additions here, Guard Counter, Critical and Mounted Damage, as well as Stat Increase to every single stat in various combinations. As I previously said, all classes have a new starting zone, so keep an eye out for new buildings or structures. This is where we get more paths to follow. There's for example a small windmill village added to Limgrave, which is the Godslayer's new starting area. A lot of the caves, catacombs and tunnels have some new designs and new enemies to fit their theme. Loving these changes as they make exploring just that much more fun. Enough of that though, let's return to our apparent path. After utterly destroying Darewill together with Blythe and getting more Thorn Sorcery, I saw something completely new down below. The path through led to the stranded graveyard in our beloved Cave of Knowledge. Except, there is no knowledge to be found down here anymore. This is now a blood-soaked area with all sorts of blood-oriented enemies, even the Captain Prelates. I took this opportunity to try some new sorceries, and well, they look kinda cool, but we're not really all too useful. Bit ironic that all blood enemies bleed very easily. I really hoped that they would have changed the Soldier of Godric to some blood-infused type boss, but instead there was another Bloodhound Knight down here. It wasn't even close. Right? With him down, we get a new weapon that fit our build perfectly. There was also a teleporter that took us all the way to the Shaded Castle. Almost as if this route was made for the Thorn Gang. The Ash of War is also quite cool in this bunky stick. Over here, we also find the Clean Rot set, which besides the attributes also gives a bonus to physical damage. In the Convergence, it's all about the path. And Elmer was on our list. With pure skill and raw determination, I managed to take him down on my first try. Okay, you got me. It looked a lot like this the first couple of times. Even Round Table Hold has received a couple of changes. Down here, where we'd normally get invaded by a Bleed and Frost high skill gamer, is now a training dummy. Over at the Impaler's Catacombs, Madness has taken over. We have some Frenzy Casters and Frenzy Infused Rats, but the coolest thing was that Burial Watchdog was changed to fit the theme as well. Speaking of cool changes, one thing that I thought would be nice in the vanilla game was that the Leonine bosses who drop legendary weapons would wield them. And they do here, a very fitting touch to all in all a mediocre boss. There is a bunch of new teleporters in many areas. Castle Morn is no exception. This teleporter takes us to Warm Hug in the Shunning Grounds. A bit too early at this point, but makes sense lore-wise. In general, there has been a big lift to all different types of dungeons. Here in the Earth War Cave, we have another new boss in the Winged Dame. At this point, the Thornbill was really starting to come together with bleeds fucking left and right. An important piece of this that I have not touched on yet is the Heirloom Remnants. They turn into some of the best talismans available. Put these together with a stat increase from armor sets and you can quickly gain so much more power. When fighting Godric, I noticed that he had gotten a lot beefier. But unfortunately for him, all we do is bleed, bleed, bleed. He drops a couple of new things. A keystone to the forge, as well as his great rune. We need five of these keystones to burn the Erd Tree. All great runes are now good to go once received, so no need to go to Divine Tower. In the Convergence, his rune gives us 10% HP and 10% more runes. 
With Enya locked up, get the Elmer set. And with Godric's Remembrance, we can buy his axe and dragon head without even using up the Remembrance. With the set and heirlooms, we move over to Lyurnia. Some new encampments are added and is a perfect place to test our new spells. Had such a good time exploring these new places in the open world. Let me know if your favorite changes here in the Convergence mod. Rhea Lucaria was pretty much the same. Renala no longer wears her strange hat, so her fashion is up to date. The Grace is now outside the library, so if one would die, there's no long annoying run back to the boss. This is where we say goodbye to our thorny ways and look elsewhere. A perfect opportunity since we can easily respec here at any given time. From bleed to bleed, I know, but trust me, this is way cooler. Our first stop is at the Roads End Catacombs. Out of all things, I didn't expect a Bloodbird to be in here, even though it was a little buggy and got stuck everywhere. We swiftly take care of the poor snail and get some new incantations. Our attire was no longer appropriate for our build, so it was time for a costume change. Everything that is done is with the path in mind. Part of the path, part of the ship. The Blood Boon Spray was my new favorite addition to the kit. Good range and leaves a bloody trail. Very nice. At the end of the Poison Cave, there is another teleporter, this time taking us all the way to the beloved Lake of Rot. There's a lot of changes made to this area which are very appreciated. For starters, the Resistance Talismans now gives complete immunity, which is too strong, but we take those. There's a tree here now, a big bridge and an arena, you definitely can't guess what's in there. Before we cover the entirety of the infamous hellscape, there's one new cool thing added to the round table. This statue lets us challenge bosses we have already defeated. We don't get anything else but runes as a prize, but still a good addition. When I went back to fight Godric again, Gostok was for some reason here and got very angry at the commotion. They are likely to fix this, but was a hilarious discovery. And yeah, he died during the heat of battle. <laughs> was a 10 out of 10 moment. Altus hosted a few upgrades for our Blood Flame. My favorite spell is the Blood Flame Outburst. Big damage and big AoE, one can't complain. In the Windmill Village, we find the Godslayer's Seal, piquing my interest just a wee bit. I also found a new legendary weapon in a tunnel and decided to give it a shot, saying goodbye once and for all to our blood shenanigans, as I swapped my build to fit the bill and decided to give one more sorcery a try. The Dragonkin Ice Stuff. Yeah. That looks cool. With our new setup, I paid a visit to the Fringe Folk Hero's Grave. There is no horse chariot here anymore, but a lot of claymen and Albanoric archers, as well as some Nox monks. The Ash of War on this axe is so damn cool. With the axe in hand, I return to the Rot Lake. As you might have guessed, it is the Dragonkin soldiers sleeping in the middle of the arena. The only surprise here was how terrible this sorcerer really was. With that failure out of the way, the path forward was clear. Incantations. It was time to become a god slayer. At this point, the hardest part was finding all the gear pieces I wanted to equip. Leonia's Divine Tower was the first stop of our ascension. Let's try these bad boys out. Yeah, the Firestorm sucks. Okay, the Black Wave is a bit better. I went to the Jail Cave to get a feel for everything. This place was now a Frenzy Cave and hosted a Frenzy Troll as its boss. Out of all things, the Godslayer Sickle was for sure the best. Basically being a stronger carry and slicer with damage over time effect. As a reward for our troubles, we picked up some frenzy spells and gear. These will come into play later. Besides some redesigned dungeons and Kaelid, Redmain Castle has also gotten some changes. We now enter through the actual gate instead of going around the cliffside. It is still very loyally protected by Redmain soldiers, of course. The boss here is a completely new entity. Duck, the Starcaller Lord, now descends from the skies to protect the courtyard, wielding Ruin's greatsword like a complete berserk with a gravity twist. Thus far, one of my personal favorite new bosses added in this mod. The Godslayer path now takes us to Caleb's Divine Tower. You know the one where you fall and roll down? I mean, where you jump. Trust me, we totally got down without too many problems. I forgot to mention this, but the Godslayer seal has superb holy scaling, and that is why I'm using the Triple Rings of Light as a solid range option. Here is where we get the better Godslayer set from the Apostle. We still had a lot to prove to our brethren, so we had to take them down to steal their powers. Somebody must have had a laugh designing the Black Flame Mortar, as it's almost impossible to land on anything besides the ceiling. The only change in the manner is the fight versus Rikard. It is no longer a gimmick fight, as we now fight him without the Snake Spear. A better zoom is a warm welcome, as we can now actually see something. His rancor of incredible bullshit still exists. We still have one more stop in Altus before entering the capital. In the Orisa Hero's Grave, we find the Earthbreaker Seal for bestial incantations. They have also removed all but one duo fight. I'll let you guys guess which one is still present. 
made another quick change to try some dragon cult stuff out before entering the capital. One big change is this route stretching all the way down to the Path of Rold, serving as a great shortcut to the Snowy Lands. There is another new legendary weapon here as well. Let me know if there's some that I've missed. Godwin's Crackblade is a twin blade with a unique moveset and Ash of War. If anything, I think this was the game telling me to commit to a Dragon Cult build for now. Just look at that dash attack. Nasty. Where we usually fight the spirit of Godfrey is another new boss, Sigur the Night Captain. Makes sense, as Morgoth is the one that tells us to fear the knight for his cavalry. Sigur's moveset is pretty much the same of a Colosseum Berserker. He did also use a spell very reminiscent to the omens in the Shunning Grounds. He did end up spamming it quite a bit when he got low HP. A good idea, but I think this boss needs some work to get to that next level. After defeating him, I noticed something strange. A cavalry horse, just standing there. My best guess is that Sigurd is supposed to be riding on it during the fight, but it has not been implemented yet. During the fight with Morgoth, we had a fabulous display of what Godwin's Crackblade is capable of. When it is buffed with lightning, the heavy attack changes to an incredibly strong combo attack. Poor fella did not stand a chance. The path note also listed that an invisible scarab is hiding our best Dragon Cult set. With our attire good to go, I remember that I had not explored much of the Dragon Burrow. My first plan was to check if the route way had been changed. There was a new jump pad here, which made it way easier to get down. A whole new arena is here, even presenting a new grace. This is also a good time to talk about all the new various buffs that are a big part of the convergence. Each class has up to three buffs, but you can mix and match as long as you have the requirements for it. All classes also have a debuff that you throw on the enemy to make it weaker to your element. In this case, it's lightning. This is where that gargoyle who normally stands outside of Gorong's house has been moved. Back all the buffs, debuffs, physic, and bonuses from gear and talismans together with a ridiculously powerful incantation, and this is what you get. The power to kill a god. In this case, a gargoyle, but still a display of how it looks and feels playing this mod in the late game. The boss has not simply been moved here to display a cool new arena. It also serves as an alternative way to Farum Azula. Awesome, right? There are some very interesting changes here. One of my favorites is this whole new path on the outer rim of debris takes us to another new arena with a boss that we normally fight elsewhere, Lanciax the Ancient Dragon. What is interesting about this is not the fight itself, as it is just another good old fight with a dragon. It is what it leads to. After defeating Lanciax, we can take another path, this one taking us all the way to what normally is a quote-unquote hidden boss, and it is one of the absolute coolest fights in the vanilla game. This is, of course, where we lie down and go back to a time where Placidusax ruled the skies. Here is where I almost felt bad. The strength of this build reaches a new peak. This played a lot into the fact of his hitbox being incredibly huge, so my lightning beacons dealt damage almost too many times, making this one of the easier fights of my entire playthrough. Yeah, that is just disgusting. I suppose we take those. With him down, we get our hands on the ire of the Thunder God. You know, the one where he stabs the ground with a massive fork of lightning, stopping the music and devastating everything within reach. Yep, we can use that spell. Sure, it doesn't stop the music when we use it, but definitely one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a video game. As I've previously mentioned, all duo fights have been removed. We now fight Sira, Blade of the Ancients, instead of the Godskin Double. Sierra fights pretty much like any of those tiger things that are all jumpy with a blade, except that this guy has a red lightning and deals a crap ton of damage. It did not help that all of my damage was also lightning. And unlike all recent boss fights that I've shown, I could not cheese him with the lightning beacon as he was just moving around way too much. So I had to do it the old fashioned way. Defeating him would get the last of the spell runes for the dragon cult, as well as a new weapon. A halberd with lightning affinity, as well as an ash of war that basically turns us to a madman thrashing about. Hilarious, but effective. The two last spells that we got look very flashy, but were not that practical to use. Now for our last stop in Perumazula, Garanka. I was really hoping that the Convergence team would have given him two full HP phases, but that is unfortunately not the case. Simply just standing below poor Malekith and spamming R1 is all it takes to dispose of him and get our last keystone. His weapon and the Black Blade incantation. In honor of Goronk, I decided to at least try the beast stuff out. On the way to a beast rune, I found the Stone Claws, another new weapon with a new Ash of War. Protecting said rune was myself. We had an epic showdown, but in the end, I was the better me. 
Sorry me. As for the beast incantations, the crucible spear is a pretty cool one, but compared to all the other stuff I've tried on my journey, I was a bit disappointed. The stone claws bestial mauling, however, is strong. Really strong. It gives us close to unbreakable poise whilst unloading a series of slashes with an awesome finish. Don't know if you noticed, but this Leonine was also wielding the Golden Order sword and gives us the last rune for the Holy Sect. Until now, the Golden Order incantations has basically been buffs together with Rings of Light. But the Exploding Spear, Elden Stars and Golden Displacement add some flair to what previously was a quite boring class. I tried this out for a little bit as well and got the Gold Mask set after revealing Radarika's secret. This was by far the most FP consuming class I had yet to try, but it did deliver. Bunch of AoE damage combined with voice breaking effects is always useful. There is a couple of incantation classes that I have yet to try, but I will include one more. The Mad One. I lost the footage of me picking up this new greatsword in the Yellow Annex Ruins, but the path took us to the Shunning Grounds. Tabriris Revenge is the Ash of War of this bad boy and it ought to be one of my favorite of all the new ones that I've found. Speaking of new weapons, I found another new legendary in the Axe of Rust. This one's for the Strength Gang. After successfully jumping down, getting some love from the Three Fingers and burning Hayata's eyes, we're blessed with a Frenzy Rune. Hold your ads because this is a good one. We all know that the vanilla Frenzy incantations are powerful, but this takes it to the next level. We have a beam, a fast long range nuke, and two things that damages what feels like the entire freaking world. Just look at this insanity. And it even covers the landscape with Frenzy Flame. Kudos to whoever came up with this. The Deep Root Depths has received some changes as well. Now there's three visible light beams spread across the region. On the way to the first beam, there are Nox Monks patrolling around. And as you can see, we're dealing damage to things that are not even visible to us. So damn cool. First boss encounter is a Dragonkin Soldier. Besides the fact that it almost one-shots, there's not much more to talk about. Defeating him, this beam of light vanishes. On the way to the second, there's a bunch of misbegottens in the way. Here is a perfect example of why dealing damage to almost everything in the entire world can actually be a problem. After narrowly escaping the onslaught of a thousand misbegottens, we deal with Siluria and remove the second beam of light. Across the routes, the path to Fia's warm hugs is blocked by this gate, clearly indicating that we must kill all bosses where the light shines. This time, there is a bunch of those who live in death, and the boss is no different. The Blighted Nox Ancestor is another cool addition to the pool of new bosses, spraying waves of frost and lunging at us with a big club that causes massive explosions. The AI for this one seemed to have issues keeping track of my position, unfortunately. But just like the rest of them, he suffered the cause of Shabriri's revenge. If it wasn't for the music still going, I would have missed to secure his demise. And with that, the path to the Lich Dragon was now open. No need for cute quest chains, just get in there and fight the boss. The never-ending assault of Frenzied Flame was too much for even Fortisax. No, nothing can stand in our way for hugs from Fia. Before burning the Earth Tree, I wanted to see what the last rune for the God Slayers would do. In the Spirit Color Cave there is, or was, a style that had our prize. I left my Frenzied Ambitions behind to become a God Slayer once more. The God Slayer stuff is a bit clunkier, but has so much potential. The Dusk Bolt has good range and deals a lot of damage, and the Scythe is just a gap-closing monster that puts even Malekith to shame. The Convergence is just too damn good. With all these options available, it got hard to choose. It was to be the Dragon Cult until the very end. And so, I burned the Erd Tree. Ah, I knew you'd come. Ah. Yep, Gideon gets assassinated by Skarda the Betrayer of the Crucible. Skarda fights just like a Crucible Knight would, but with basically all the Crucible incantations at his disposal. He can deflect attacks and spells with his shield. I did use the Axe of Rust for this fight, and he even blocked the Titanic Cleave Ash of War. This is the only new boss with a new remembrance. Feel free to pause at this screen if you want to read through it. There is unfortunately a part missing at the bottom, which is a bit sad. With the Remembrance, we get his Greatsword. It deals 100% holy damage and has a very powerful Ash of War. Godfrey is still in our way, and I decided to try out the sword here, even though I know he's quite resistant to holy damage. It turned out to be a complete circus. Apparently, I need to practice against Horlu for my no-hit run. If I was a basketball, he truly was Michael Jordan. 
So after a while, and I truly mean after a while, I got my shit together and put him to his knees. No, Godfrey, I do not deserve a crown after this showing. Perhaps a clown suit, if you had one around here. As a true gamer, I put all the blame onto the sword. I picked up Godfrey's axe that I have never before tried out, so I can't say if it has been changed, but it had a really cool Ash of War, even though it is super slow. Luckily, Radagon is susceptible to having his poise broken, so it worked out. Nothing about the last three bosses has been changed, which is probably for the better, as they're all quite good ones. And now we also know that Horalu was busy playing basketball after he got banished from the lands by Marika. And oh yeah, one thing is new. We can ride Torrent versus the Elden Beast. Just don't mount when he uses his waves of light. That is stupid. With a last clap and a celebratory roar unleashed, we were done. If you have not yet tried out the Convergence mod, I strongly suggest that you do it. There's so many cool changes. Perhaps not if you only play melee builds, but even still, a bunch of cool changes all around the game. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this content, as I have a bunch of things planned for the future. Keep an eye out for live streams, and come and say hi if you've got the time. Let's hope Melina doesn't find us after we ravage the lands. Take care, and I'll see you guys in the next one.